Uh, yeah, I am uh, WB1FJ. Uh, I'm an AMSAT life member, a uh, member of the Nashua Area Radio Society. And uh, I volunteer for AMSAT as the lead flight software developer. That was my career was developing software and I always wanted to do something in space. So here I am. Uh, by the way, I, I you know, I, I came in here and and you know saw all all the cars lined up and I said, my gosh, this is going to be some <laughs> hell of a of a ham radio meeting. But uh, oh well. Anyway, um, so let me. Whoops. The arrow does not do the trick. Okay, good, thank you. Oh, I had to select the window, of course. Yeah, so um, first off, how many, well, I can't see everybody on the screen, but how many people have uh, worked satellites before? Okay, so we've got some experience, a little bit of experience, but let me just mention uh, that AMSAT is um, a nonprofit volunteer organization. Um, I'm not big into mission statements, but you know, here's here's the things that we do kind of to summarize what AMSAT is all about, what most AMSAT care about, is that we're the organization that builds and find la finds launches for the US-made amateur radio satellites. Now there's a lot of amateur radio satellites, uh, a lot of them from different countries. Uh, there are AMSAT organizations all over the world, but we're the ones that uh, do the United States-based uh, ones. So I wanna talk about about a few things. The main subject is going to be uh, the programs that we're working on, the Gulf Project, uh, Fox Plus, uh, Ascent, and uh, a little bit about LTM. But I do want to just mention something about members. Um, MSAT has no paid staff. Okay, so if you call the MSAT phone number, uh, you're going to get um, uh, a recording. And uh, you know, leave a message, and somebody someday will get back to you. Um, if you send an email, it's a little bit more, uh, uh, a little bit speedier. Paper mail is also slow. But the point being that we used to have a, a secretary that we paid. We don't anymore. She retired, and uh, so it's all volunteer. Uh, but in addition, most of our satellites are built by volunteer members, including me. Um, we sometimes, of course, have to buy parts, and sometimes we've even bought satellites. Launches are sometimes bought, and you, you might be surprised at how, <laughs> I'll say inexpensive, uh, a launch is for a little CubeSat. Um, but we also try to get grants from NASA. There's a program called the CSLI program uh, that we have gotten three or four different grants for launching satellites from. So that's worked out nicely. Our income is membership dues that pay for general ops, uh, a lot of donations, and the donations pay for hardware launches and so on, and uh, legacy gifts, of course. So that's how AMSAT works. Now, some of you, whoops. I just wanted to say that uh, if you haven't seen a ham using an amateur radio satellite, here is one. Uh, this girl was nine years old at the time of the video. Um, she had a technician license. Uh, now she's in college. Uh, she's got an extra license, and I believe she has a uh, an ARL scholarship. And uh, one of the projects she's working on is what? Building satellites. So she, she's quite a kid. Here we go. Well, close enough, but um, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, but the, the point being that you can make satellite contacts with fairly inexpensive equipment. She's got an HD, she's got a recorder, uh, she's got an, uh, let's see, that's an arrow antenna. And you might notice the stick, she's got a forked stick to uh, uh, keep the weight off her wrist. And 
heaven knows we are who are considerably older than she is uh, need such a thing. Oh, there we go. Uh, on the other hand, uh, someone like me who doesn't really want to go out and hold these things at all, you can uh, you can spend money and do something like this. This is my um, satellite setup. Uh, there's a azimuth and elevation rotator that you'll see in the middle there um, with a two meter and a 70 centimeter antenna. And uh, I have the computer set up so that it will point the antenna at the appropriate place and also adjust the radio for uh, Doppler correction as the satellite comes toward me and goes away from me. Uh, kinds of amateur radio satellites. So we're going to, I'm going to mention the names of these a couple of times. I wanted to make sure it was clear what we have. There's basically two kinds of voice relay satellites. One is FM, frequency modulation. It's a lot like a terrestrial repeater. The only difference is the uplink and the downlink are separated by two different bands. They're not just uh, a megahertz or so, or so apart or a few kilohertz apart. Um, like a repeater, you get one user at a time. Like a repeater, it's pretty clear in in, uh, in voice. There's also something called a linear satellite. A linear satellite repeats everything within its uplink bandwidth, and the bandwidth is 30 kilohertz or so, and it repeats it on the downlink. So if you use, say, sideband, which is, what, three, three kilohertz wide, you can get a lot of people using sideband within that 30 kilohertz uh, band pass. Uh, you can also use CW. Uh, you can use FT4. That There's uh, a number of people that have started using F FT4 and uh, really weak signal stuff. But like any sideband, um, it's kind of fussy tuning. And uh, But there, you can have multiple users at one time, like I said. And there's lots of different kinds of digital satellites. I'll talk about one later. So that's that's just kind of the intro of what we're talking about, what are amateur radio satellites all about. Um, let's move on to AMSAT programs. Um, so I'm going to talk about the program that we call GOLF first. GOLF cleverly stands for Greater Orbit Larger Footprint. So greater really means higher, but well, HALF doesn't sound like a very good name. And besides the previous uh, the previous satellites were called F Echo and Fox. So, you know, golf really has to be next. Um, why do we want a higher orbit? Uh, the The biggest reason is if you if you look at these pictures, I, yeah, you can see these pictures actually better than I can. This circle, uh, there's a satellite right here over, what is that, Finland, I guess. No, not Finland, one of those countries. Um, and this circle is showing who can see the satellite. So with anybody within that circle can see the satellite, and that means anyone within that circle can talk to anyone else within that circle. Now you can see it's not terribly big. Uh, this is probably, um, oh, I don't know, uh, what is that, SO50? So that's uh, 600 kilometers or so high. And yeah, you can get across the Atlantic from, from where we are, you can, you can reach Spain, you can reach the UK, and so on, but not huge distances. As you go higher, as the satellite goes higher, as you might expect, that circle gets bigger and bigger. And uh, on this picture here, over on the right, uh, that is a, a satellite called IO-117, uh, the Italy AMSAT group um, was able to uh, build that one, it's a digital satellite. And uh, let's see, how high is that? That's 6,000 kilometers. And you can see it pretty much covers half the Earth. But at 6,000 kilometers, it's also still moving in orbit relative to where you are. So you get a long period of time overhead. You can have a long QSO. You can have a distant QSO. But it will eventually go out of your, uh, out of your range. If we could get way the heck up at what is it, 26,000 miles or something, the geosynchronous band, then it would hang over us and we could use it infinitely, essentially. But that's for the future. So the first satellite that we're actually working on now is called Golf T. T 
our vice president of engineering loves acronyms. T stands for technology evaluation environment. Um, the regulatory environment in the United States and the uh, the Italy people who did I O one seventeen didn't have to go through this because they are somewhere else. But in the United States, the regulatory environment is really difficult for getting satellites up high. They they tell you that you have to be able to return the satellite to Earth, get it out of orbit uh, within, I think it's five years after end of mission. And they typically assume that a CubeSat isn't gonna last any time at all, so it's five years after launch. Well, uh, you know, from 500 kilometers, maybe it'll come down in five years, uh, not for thousands of kilometers for sure. So we have somebody working on that. We've got people that have ideas we've been talking with government agencies, the FCC, the uh, NASA, and so on. And, and there's some ideas here. Uh, you could also put a put a rocket motor on it, but that's way beyond our capability right at the moment. Um, but this golf tee uh, is planned to, assuming that we'll be able to get higher, let's test some technology that we will need to get higher. So one of the things that we want to test is a 10 gigahertz downlink and several microwave uplinks. The reason you want 10 gigahertz downlink uh, is because if you're up higher, you probably want a dish. If you want a dish, then you want higher frequencies so the dish can be a reasonable size on the satellite. Uh, this satellite, Golf T, will be fully attitude stabilized. So we can have it pointing, either the antenna pointing at straight at the earth or the solar panels pointing straight at the sun. Um, so this is, we've done a lot of stuff like this long ago, but this is new for us with CubeSats, let's put it that way. Um, it will have a redundant, what we call IHU, um, which is the onboard computer. It'll have redundant command receivers and telemetry transmitters, uh, but it will also have a traditional 30 kilohertz uh, VHF up UHF down a linear transponder. Um, you've probably, heard, if you've paid any attention to AMSAT, you will have heard this, heard about this for a very long time, but uh, we've had so many delays. Um, a key team member and friend uh, became a silent key, which was shocking to all of us. This was the, um, you know, our main mechanical engineer, Bob Davis, KF4KSS. Um, we had the supply chain problem during the pandemic. Uh, so the plan for our attitude control system and power system uh, just did not pan out. They, they could not build it. Um, and on top of everything, delays mean that parts are going end of life. So even the stuff that we have already built, we can't build it anymore because we can't get those parts. We need to redesign it. Anyway, the program is now going ahead. We've gotten a whole bunch of new volunteers, uh, which is is really nice. Uh, we have to bring them up to speed, which is um, takes a long time. I mean, I've been working on the on the Fox satellite since twenty. The first one was launched in twenty fifteen, so I've been working on it for a couple of years before that. So there's a lot of information that we need to get to these new volunteers. But um, it's great that we have um, interest again. This is what Golf T looks like, a cutaway drawing. It's called a 3U CubeSat. And a, uh, each U, one unit, is 10 by 10 by 10, about four inches cubed. So a 3U is 10 by 10 by 30. So about four inches by a foot, something like that. And um, inside it. Oh, you can't see the, let's see if I can move the, ah, there we go. And look at this. Um, so we've, this, this stack is actually going sideways and it's got most of those boards that I was talking about. This is the redundant uh, uh, internal computer, the uh, RXTX module that does the linear transponding. Uh, this is the command receiver. Uh, this is uh, a, a different, computer. Uh, and here's an experiment which will uh, is from Vanderbilt University that will help us get it launched for free. 
So let's just take a look at what some of these um, these things look like. This is the way golf looks right now. This is in my shack. And um, so right here is that what we call the longitudinal stack. It's got the computers and the RXTX board and so on. Uh, over here is a, um, a board that kind of combines everything together. And uh, you can see the USB coming out of it. That's the equivalent of the umbilical. That is how you, pl how you plug in the satellite while, um, when it's uh, actually sealed up in the on the rocket. And right here is part of our attitude control system. And, oh, and um, over here is the microwave radio. We won't be, we'll be taking it out of that, that case. Curiosity, what surface is that? Is that a 205 or a 210? Uh, 310, yeah. So a uh, close-up of the RTIHU. RT stands for radiation tolerant, and that means we hope it's radiation tolerant. Uh, yeah, it's made up of um, two Texas Instruments uh, processors called TMS-570. And they're automotive grade processors. So automotive grade um, doesn't necessarily mean rad hard, but they are designed so that your uh, so uh, your brakes don't fail if there's a random cosmic ray coming through them. So yeah, they, they have they, they're better than what we had before. We believe uh, on top of everything, they have uh, um, um, what is it? Why can't I think of the word? Uh, the, the memory is error detecting and correcting. And there's a lot of internal buses with parity and all sorts of stuff like that. Plus, there are two of the processors, one here and one here. If one of them dies, it switches over to the other one. Down the middle here are bus switches. So only one of them is on the bus. And if one of them fails, we pull it off the satellite bus so it won't uh, screw things up. Uh, both of these boards also have a command receiver and a telemetry transmitter, and either one can double as the other. Uh, this is the attitude determination and control system. We are buying this from a company called CubeSpace in South Africa. Uh, there's a picture. The picture here shows a star tracker. We don't need that kind of um, that, that kind of sensitivity. So we won't have a star tracker on it. We'll have a, a magnetic sensor and what we call core, coarse sun sensors. So we have a pretty good idea where the sun is and a pretty good idea where the earth is. That's really all we need. Uh, right at the moment, all we have is this bottom board right here. That's um, the cube computer. And we have that because I'm the guy who has to figure out how to talk to it. And so that's what we need. We don't need all the rest of the stuff yet. Uh, here's that cube computer board, again, sitting around in my shack. And uh, so far, we've run their, their tests on it. It works fine. I've connected it to the onboard satellite computer. I'm just starting to figure out how to get and send data to it. And the golf power system, uh, as I said, we couldn't get uh, the, the people that we were going to buy it from uh, went under. And so um, we can't get it there, but we do have a volunteer who knows a lot about power systems. Uh, we have two actually, and uh, they are uh, building this thing. It's called an MPPT, Maximum PowerPoint Tracker. So essentially uh, you pull the amount of power out of a solar panel that will, or the amount of the, the current out of a solar panel that will give you the maximum amount of power, and um, and uh, you know adjust the voltages all to to match. There's also a battery management system to keep the battery charged appropriately. Uh, you guys know about that from your repeater, and um, a power distribution system to make the correct voltages. So you ask, when is this going to launch? Uh, good question. Um, there's a lot to be done, uh, including building a space uh, space frame to hold all of these boards, uh, building solar panels that will open up 
and point to the sun. Uh, the microwave upshifter and power amplifier is designed and partially built, but it needs to be uh, continued. The power system needs to be completed. And there is a ton of paperwork. You've heard the story about the airplane gets off the ground when the paperwork exceeds the weight of the airplane. Well, it's pretty much the same with satellites. So that's the golf program. Uh, just pause for a second if you have any questions on golf. Okay. Um, the Fox Plus program. So Fox One were was our, the set of satellites that I first worked on. And uh, Fox 1A, AO85, launched in um, 2015. In fact, almost exactly how many ever years ago that is, in October. <laughs> so um, we are 85, 91, and 92 are the FM satellites that were successful. Um, and they're really popular because they had a nice strong signal. And FM satellites are pretty easy to use, like the girl you saw there at the beginning. It's an inexpensive antenna, inex relatively inexpensive radio, and you can travel ar around and do uh, grid squares and, and everything like that that you want. Um, but there are getting to be fewer and fewer FM satellites. They're popular, but um, a number of them have failed or are failing. Uh, it turns out AO91 is still working, which is a nice thing. Um, SO50 has been working for a very long time, and there are some satellites called Tevel um, that you have to watch which ones. I think there's six of them, and they turn on a couple of them at a time. Um, but those are the only FM satellites at the, at the moment. Um, but we also want to have more linears available because linears reduce crowding even faster because you can have so many people using a linear. So Fox Plus is a new program that builds on Fox One with, uh, with improvements. So the philosophy for Fox Plus is build on Fox One. We already have some information. We have experience with Fox One, even though there's a lot of uh, unobtainium type of components on it now. Uh, also build on work that we've done on, on golf because there's a lot of stuff that's gone on on golf in the past multiple years. Uh, Fox Plus work can also flow back into golf, which is a really nice thing. But one of the exciting things about Fox Plus is that it's all going to be open source, open access, and so on. All the documents, all the code will be on GitHub. Um, that means there's more grants available, and we avoid issues with this thing called ITAR, which is the International Traffic in Arms Regulations. God knows why the US government thinks our crappy little satellites are munitions, but in some cases they do. So that means that up until recently, we have only been able to have US citizens, US persons, which includes citizens, green card holders, and a, a few other things working with us. But, um, with the open source and open access, there's a kind of a cutout of the ITAR regulations that uh, means that we can hire, hire. We can we can have volunteers from anywhere that are not citizens. We do still have to worry about exporting stuff. There's export regulations, but that's a different different question and more easily dealt with. So Fox Plus A, the first one, is going to be one U, so four by four roughly. Um, magnetically stabilized, so there's just a bar magnet in it that follows the magnetic field of the Earth, and it will be a linear transponder in it. And they're going to purchase the space frame in order to speed up development. Uh, later Fox Plus versions, we hope, will be bigger, pull in work from a program called Ascent, which I'll talk about in a minute, another one of Jerry's wonderful uh, acronyms. And um, we hope to include a new FM repeater, maybe even a multi-channel FM repeater in uh, future satellites. Whoops, shift doesn't work there. So some of the differences between Fox One 
eventually uh, between Fox One and eventually Fox Plus. Fox Plus, we hope, will eventually inherit the RTIHU, that radio radiation tolerant uh, processor, and uh, thus add to its reliability. Although I've got to say that in the Fox ones with the older IHU, that was never one of the things that failed. It was a battery problem, really. Um, so uh, yeah, there's a bunch of stuff there about the RTIHU that I've already talked about, really. Um, the RTIHU has this telemetry downlink, which is 1200 bits per second uh, phase shift keying, binary phase shift keying. And it's also uh, has the command uplink. Uh, the power we hoped uh, we're, we'll be using lithium based chemistry rather than NICAD. Um, lithium, we hope, will, will work better. I think the problem with the NICADs before were that uh, we're, I mean, NICADs are supposed to be good for deep cycling, which we were doing. We were certainly deep cycling it. But the other problem with the Fox satellites is that our thermal modeling was awful. It, they were much, they were hot, believe it or not. We expected them to go down below zero C. And we had heaters on the battery and all kinds of stuff. No, no, they never went down below 20. So, so we think that uh, probably it was uh, overcharging and overheating that killed the batteries on these things. But in any case, uh, we will have lithium um, on the Fox Plus and also on Golf for that matter. And we really want the batteries to be uh, able to be removed from the circuit when they fail. That was one of the big problems. It's been one of the big problems with satellites forever that often the batteries will fail short. And if they fail shorted, then even in the sun, you don't you don't get any power from the solar panels. So the current status, uh, it's being managed by our VP of engineering, Jonathan. Um, we've got a number of new re recruits, um, new volunteers recruited for that program as well. We're meeting concurrently with the golf team. So it's, it's great. There's a lot of cross fertilization and it helps the new volunteers kind of know what's going on. We actually have a big, huge list of acronyms and uh, what is it when you can't pronounce it? Um, hmm. I don't know, there's a word for acronym when you can't pronounce it. Uh, the concept of operations, requirements and that sort of thing are being written. And optimistically, uh, the first Fox Plus might launch in two years, but well, you know how that works. Uh, future Fox Pluses are likely to be larger, a 3U size CubeSat. With a 3U size CubeSat, uh, it allows for deployable solar panels, giving you a lot more power and more capabilities. And it will take advantage of Ascent projects. Again, I'll talk about Ascent in a second. Um, there's no real design or details yet, just a kind of general concept of what will happen in the future. So finally, we get to the Ascent program that I've been teasing you with. Uh, the original Ascent program uh, did develop some concepts earlier, um, like the RTIHU was, was part of an Ascent program before. Uh, what Ascent, let's see, where does it, does it say what it, oh yeah, here we go. Advanced Satellite Communication and Exploration of New Technology. Ah, oh, my gosh. I wish I were that clever. But anyway, um, you can kind of think of it as a as a research and development, or if you're into uh, Lockheed Martin uh, skunk works or something like that, it's, it's the idea is to develop new ideas that don't necessarily have a specific satellite that they're going to be used in. So the RTIHU was developed before golf. We were just trying it out and it worked so well that we, decide to incorporate it into golf and uh, later into Fox Plus. Um, let's see. Um, yes, the microwave RF also came out of Ascent. So, um, but now we've switched uh, focus a little bit and the Ascent program is also totally open source and open design. It went into hibernation for a while. Um, because it was largely there to develop 
on technology for a particular program that um, that our partner didn't get accepted for. So then it kind of hibernated, but we're but it's it's back now, and I think um, bigger and better. Current ascent projects, um, we are designing a three U space frame with deployable deployable solar panels. And, and I mentioned that if um, that if if it's open source, then we get more grant grant possibilities. One of those grant possibilities is the ARDC, Amateur Radio Digital Communication, and that's a private foundation. They made a huge huge amount of money. Um, talk to me afterwards if you're curious about how it how it worked. Um, and uh, they exist to support amateur radio and digital communication science and technology. So thank you to ARDC. And by the way, they are looking for projects to fund. So if anybody has an open source project that's related to amateur radio that, uh, um, you know, feel free to ask them, can't hurt. And the, this um, is likely, this um, particular uh, space frame is likely to be used for Fox Plus and for golf. And since it's open source, hopefully other people will also be able to use it besides us. Uh, another ascent project, AMSAT uh, uh, developed reaction wheels for attitude control. I, saw, I told you that we are buying the attitude control system for golf, but at the same time in the ascent program, we had somebody that was really interested in trying to develop uh, his own. And so what you see in the, in the picture here is a vibration test on uh, one of his attitude control um, pieces. And it only has a single dimension that he's testing there. Um, uh, the motor is right behind it. And uh, we are hoping that this will work okay. We now have also a volunteer to work on the software for this thing. And gosh, that is uh, the math for uh, attitude control systems is um, horrendous, shall we say. So I'm glad I'm not doing it. But um, it's going slowly, and that's the good thing about Ascent, is that things can go slowly. We don't have a launch right in the immediate future. And um, finally, for Ascent, uh, I want to talk about Paxat. So Paxat is a packet satellite, a digital packet store and forward system. Um, it's it's um, got multiple uplink frequencies, uh, multiple and a multiplexed downlink. So you can think of it as a mailbox and file distribution in the sky. So, for example, you can send a message and um, uh, you know tell uh, say that the call sign is VE somebody or other in India, and um, no VE is Canada, V something else is India. What's that? Uh, yeah, yeah, right. Thank you, VA. Um, and, um, um, and you know, the, if, if they come on sometime, they can ask, is there anything for me? And it will be sent to them. But uh, AMSAT could also, for example, send their weekly newsletter up. And anybody can collect that. Um, or, or, you know, other kinds of files. Uh, uh, TLEs, which are the numbers that tell where a satellite is in orbit, you know, that kind of thing could be sent on the packet satellite. So um, this is a picture of the one of the prototypes that's in my shack at the moment. Uh, this is, you can't tell too well, but it's actually two boards. On the bottom is a um, TI evaluation board that has a processor on it. And on the top is um, a board that one of our volunteers built to be able to test it. It has the transmitter and the receiver and memory on it. So we've actually got this working quite well. We've got some packet receive and packet transmit and telemetry downlink. Um, so that's that's working quite well. Uh, Chris Thompson, who's a VE2TCP, has um, adapted his FalconSat software to work with this. And uh, we're hopefully going to be displaying this at the AMSAT Symposium, which is the weekend after next, or sorry, 
the weekend after this coming one in Dallas. Um, oh, yes, and one more thing, uh, GPS. We think GPS is going to be needed on future satellites. Uh, so the GPS project, which hasn't really started yet, uh, it'll research and test GPS receivers. Uh, and that includes uh, COCOM restrictions. And COCOM, I don't recall what the actual words are, but what it means is the GPS receivers that you typically buy for cheap can't um, can't get your position if you're going over a certain speed or over a certain altitude because they don't want the bad guys to put them in missiles. Um, but we can get around it, um, and that's what we would need for a satellite, of course. Uh, we want th this project would write software to get data from it, experiment with software to generate the orbital parameters based on several GPS data. So this is a really interesting project. Um, and I'll just, I'll just mention, if anybody is interested in volunteering for any of these projects, do send an email to volunteer, at singular, volunteer at hamsat.org. And if you have sent to uh, that address or something similar, um, you know, a year or so or, or so in the past and haven't heard from anyone, uh, we have fixed that. So please try again if you're at all interested in uh, volunteering for AMSAT. And of course, if you want to send money, you can do that too. Uh, I'll mention quickly the LTM program. Um, it's a linear transponder module. It's just a three board set. Uh, CubeSats have made it easy for universities to experiment in space, but mostly they don't want to do all the radio stuff. And radio is what we're good at. So um, we give them a radio set and um, they can use it to send telemetry from their experiments down and uh, get command uplinks. Uh, but the nice thing is that university experiments don't tend to last too long because students graduate. And so once the university is done with it, we have a linear transponder in orbit. And uh, we haven't, well, we, I won't say we haven't done any of the work, but we haven't done much of the paperwork. That's for sure. So there is a flight upcoming. The University of Maine has a satellite called MESAT-1. And uh, one of the things MESAT-1 is uh, supposed to be doing is to uh, take pictures of estuaries on the coast of Maine and try to get information about that. Uh, but in any case, uh, we hope that that will be upcoming fairly soon. Um, uh, just to tell you, the current AMSAT satellites from, from AMSAT North America, that is, um, AO91, which is uh, one of the FOX-1 satellites, is a UV, UHF up, VHF down, FM repeater. Uh, right now, its batteries are very unhappy, but for some reason, they didn't short out. So it works when it's in the sun. It may have some dropouts, but it's still cranking along. It's still sending telemetry. AO109, which was FOX1E, uh, that had a VU, that's VHF up, UHF down, 30 kilohertz uh, linear transponder, 1200 baud telemetry, um, and is working great, except something we think happened probably to the antennas. So it's a very weak transmit. In fact, the power amplifier blew, we believe, um, because of the, of the bad SWR. And uh, it's very hard to transmit to it. But there are people who have done QSOs. Uh, CW is especially good for it with a lot of power because you know, it, it's it's nice that you can receive CW, even though it's a weak downlink signal and a strong uplink signal. Uh, people have used FT4 on it. That's another good way to do it. Uh, some people have actually been able to do sideband, but they have to have a big antenna. And uh, we've been able to get pretty good telemetry from it with this antenna. This is a radio telescope in the Netherlands that the folks uh, who built it uh, didn't need it anymore. 
and gave it to the ham club in the Netherlands. So every once in a while, they will they will track our satellite across the sky and get hundreds of, of frames of telemetry. And what that means is that we've got the telemetry from the experiment that's on board from Vanderbilt University. And we've already got a couple of PhD theses out of the information that they've, they've uh, gotten from it. Um, AO7 was from back in the, geez, I don't know, 80s, 90s or something. That's still working, believe it or not, in the sun. AO27 still works some of the time uh, with time constraints. And then there's a lot of other satellites as well, uh, especially, oh, no, it's the one after this. There, I'll show you this one. Especially the International Space Station has amateur radio on it. It's got an FM repeater. It's got an APRS digipeter. And you can see the frequencies there, but you can also uh, look at eris.org. A-R-I-S-S, -S, Amateur Radio on the International Space Station. And they will tell you uh, what's going on. Occasionally, you'll even come across a live astronaut that's on. I was trying to make a contact through the repeater. And uh, I, suddenly, I got a call from uh, N1ISS, which is the call station, the call sign they use on the station. And it was really cool. You know, I got to say hello to this guy who was in orbit and got a nice QSL card. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to say the next AMSAT supported satellite will be that MESAT 1. And I already talked somewhat about that. It's launching on uh, Alana, which is the name of the Na one of the NASA programs, number 43. And it's on a Firefly Alpha rocket, the next one, in fact. Um, they have successfully launched one satellite for the Space Force so far. Another one got into orbit, but came down very quickly, and another one went kaboom. So hopefully, hopefully, Alana 43 will get in orbit um, sometime soon, this year maybe. You know how this stuff works. Who knows? So that's all I had to say. Uh, thanks very much for listening. And if you have any questions, I will be happy to tell. And please consider joining uh, AMSAT if you're interested in using satellites, and please consider donating, volunteering, anything like that. Can you talk briefly about the launch vehicle? The military, but... Sure. Uh, yeah, yeah. So the question was, can I talk about the launch vehicles? Uh, typically, s since uh, a guy named Bob Twiggs, who's a, who's a ham, invented the concept of a CubeSat uh, 15 or more years ago, uh, and the, the big concept there is that the um, deployer that goes on the rocket that releases this thing is standardized. So nearly every rocket um, has a little bit of extra space. And so the launch vehicle provider typically is very happy to get, um, you know, a few megabucks from, from providing these. So we have launched on on Atlas V, which was uh, a national security launch. We've launched on a uh, uh, a Delta Delta II, one of the last Delta IIs, um, which was a weather satellite. We've launched on, uh, um, I forget what else, but, but you know, all kinds of, none of the Fox satellites were on the same launch vehicle. We were on, oh, I know, in India, um, a PSLV uh, at one point and also on uh, on a SpaceX. Yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, the one U is typically about a, a little over a kilogram. And, and, you know, two U's is two, three U's is three, and so on. So that's, that's about what it is. We can often get uh, waivers if we're a little bit over, a little bit under. Depends on what else is in the deployer with us. So I have two questions. Uh, one, you can certainly give us the uh, the the fifty thousand foot view answer because it might be involved. Sure. So you know you've mentioned uh, you know AMSAT North America. Um, how does how do the different AMSAT sort of interact with each other? Because some you know the an AMSAT North America satellite is going to you know fly over 
more than North America. So, so how, how are the organizations sort of uh, connected? Um, they are typically not organizationally really collected, uh, connected, but we're all friends. Uh, and we often, we will, uh, we have somebody going to the UK symposium, the German symposium. Uh, I almost went to the South Africa symposium, except COVID. So I had to cancel out, but I may go next year. Um, so, you know, we're, we're all friends. Uh, typically the satellite bands the, that are used, the two meter, especially two meter and 70 centimeter bands are available to any hams around the world. There, uh, And there's a group called the IARU, International Amateur Radio Union, which uh, coordinates frequencies for satellites or, across the world so that we don't collide with each other too badly. So here, here's the second question, and this is the one that uh, you probably don't have the answer for, but when, when do I get a QO100 that I can talk about? Ah, yes, I know. So for those of you who don't know, QO100 was launched by the Telecommunication Authority in, in Qatar. Um, their their um, head sheikh and, uh, and the guy in the telecommunication uh, place are both amateurs. So they made it happen. Uh, the, I believe that the German AMSAT actually built the transponder um, and it's in geosynchronous orbit. So typically all the way from South Africa to Thailand and I don't know, maybe Hawaii, I don't know. But not to the East Coast of the US. Not to the East Coast of the US. Uh, I think Iceland can just barely get it. Um, so, so you know, that's that was the goal. That's that kind of thing is a goal for uh, us. It might be easier to get up that high, but not actually have it in synchronous orbit, because the synchronous orbit slots are really valuable. So we're not probably going to get there unless we can get somebody to launch us with them. We might get to a higher orbit, so you got a longer distance. But don't count your don't count well, too much. Not, I am envious of those that, that can reach it. Oh, I know. I see some of the neat stuff that they're doing, especially because of the uh, because it's a linear. Absolutely. And and, and but in a lot of bandwidth, people. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, I think digital TV stuff. Yeah, and they're uh, ten gig down, five gig up. I think, and and yeah, it's really wide. Yep. So so, so get on that. Uh, I'll work on it. Yeah, starting tomorrow. <laughs> Does anyone else have any other questions uh, for for Burns? What um, are you involved or know whereabouts, like with Satnogs and that whole program? I have a Satnog station in my in my house. Yep. Is that primarily how you guys are using it? AO ninety and others, or you guys have your own systems in place to? We have systems in place that will uh, decode directly. I mean, it's a uh, the the uh, Oscar. Excuse me, the Fox satellites have a weird system that. Uh, we do not have them working with uh, with satellites, although they'll pick it up and they'll they'll you know we can see it's there and if they record the audio then we can play it back. Um, the uh, radio telescope I was talking about actually is a satellite station, and um, they do exactly that. They record uh, satellites records it, and then they'll run it through our decoder, and that's how we get the uh, telemetry from that. And SATNOGS, by the way, is if you're not familiar with it, is geez, I don't even know what that stands for, but it's a it's a yeah, it's 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 a ground network around the world. It was started by a couple of guys in Greece, whom I've met, and I had one of the first stations. But they've put these stations all over the place, and um, you can anybody can ask or any member, I guess, can ask for a particular satellite to be tracked in a particular location. And it will send commands to this uh, particular station that's in that location. And the station will, mine is Omni, but if, if it's uh, trackable, it will you know, just point the antenna at the satellite and collect the data for you. Yeah, it's a great idea. I don't know if there's anybody on Zoom who had any questions for, uh, for Burns. Not, uh... Not seeing any. So uh, yep. again, I'd like to thank you very much for the okay. presentation uh, this evening. Thank you.